Thank you so much for uh, the invitation uh, to speak at your uh, conference uh, today. Uh, it's evening time on uh, Friday. It's about 8.35 in the evening here in California. So it's not terribly late, but uh, uh, I hope to uh, give you an informative uh, uh, lecture. The um, I thought I would speak about the uh, what I would say call the elements of effective crime scene investigation, and uh, by this I mean um, I'm not going to go into uh, terribly detailed descriptions of uh, how you should uh, collect fingerprints or uh, photograph crime scenes or do sketching or collect various types of evidence, but rather a high level uh, overview of some of the things that uh, you ought to be concerned about. If you want to follow me, I'm on uh, both LinkedIn and Twitter. I uh, regularly post uh, actually the same things on, on both platforms. Uh, what I've been doing for some time now is when I find interesting uh, either scientific articles or newspaper stories or um, just about anything that I, I think uh, my forensic colleagues from around the world might be interested in. I'll just post them up there uh, without any uh, real uh, opinion one way or the other, just to let you know what's uh, what's going on. I think it's important for uh, practitioners to know what the issues are around the world, because the world is a very small place and uh, we're, uh, we're likely to see similar things no matter where you are. Just uh, very briefly, uh, much of it was, co uh, was covered already. I, I grew up in New York City, attended college there, uh, got a degree, a, a bachelor's degree in chemistry. I moved into uh, the Midwest at Purdue University, which is not far from Chicago, and took a uh, master's degree in organic chemistry. And uh, somehow along the line, I, I met my future wife who was visiting a girlfriend in New York one summer. And um, my uh, aspirations of going for a PhD in chemistry did not materialize. I wound up moving out to California uh, to be with her. We eventually got married. Uh, I'll share with you that uh, we're, we're uh, celebrating our 52nd anniversary uh, in a couple of months. Uh, which these days is quite an accomplishment, I think. When I was in California, I, I, I went to uh, night school and I took a, a Master of business, business Administration from one of the colleges here in California and also started to work as a criminalist at the L.A. County Sheriff's Department, or LASD is the initials. I stayed there for uh, a month shy of 40 years. And uh, during that time, I worked in a wide variety of different assignments, uh, doing crime scene investigation, drug testing, toxicology, um, physical evidence and such. And the last 20 years of my employment, I was uh, the laboratory director. The, the laboratory at the time had a uh, a staff of about 300 individuals. Along with that, I was uh, president of a number of uh, national and international uh, forensic science uh, associations, the, the American Academy, ASCLAD, the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors, IAFS, the International Association of Forensic Sciences, uh, TF, the International Association of Forex Forensic Toxicologists, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the IAI, and a bunch of regional forensic science uh, societies. The reason for all these uh, was that I, I, I supervised a whole broad uh, range of people, and I wanted to have an idea of what it was that they were talking about once they came to see me. Uh, this is home for me. I'm speaking to you from a city uh, called Indio, as opposed to India, uh, Indio, California, which is about 200 kilometers um, east of, uh, due east of Los Angeles. It's in a desert environment. 
Uh, it's, it's quite lovely, uh, uh, except during the summer when the temperatures can get up to uh, around 50 degrees C and sometimes even a little hotter than that. But uh, that's, where, that's where I've been for the past uh, seven years. So let's talk about uh, what I'm going to call the key elements of crime scene investigation. And these, uh, what I'm going to be speaking about, are, no, are not in any particular order of importance. Uh, there, as I sat down and started to make a, an outline of them, these are the ones that popped into mind uh, for you to uh, consider. I, I think they're generally universal. Uh, I, I don't know that you'd necessarily agree with me on each and every one of these points, but uh, this is uh, my perspective of the particular subject, and uh, here we go. Well, first of all, um, I, I always like to point out that crime scenes are fluid. They're dynamic. Uh, they, they don't change very much, and it's important to get it right the first time, and I'm using here a golf term. I don't know if any of you are golfers, but there's a, an expression called a mulligan, which means a do-over. And typically, if you mess up on a, on a crime scene and you, and you leave the scene, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to uh, do it, it over and cor correct your mistakes. So uh, it's critically important to carefully consider what you're doing and be sure not to uh, mess it up. So uh, uh, you, you don't want any do-overs or mulligans in your crime scene work. When possible, it's always better to have two people conducting the crime scene investigation rather than a single person. Uh, I know that some of the uh, bureaucrats and police agencies may feel that that's uh, too uh, expensive a proposition. And there, there are many crimes that probably do not require this. I'm talking about the most serious uh, types of crimes uh, where having two people uh, at collecting evidence and documenting what it is you're, you're doing um, you could certainly break it up and have the evidence collector and the second person being the, uh, the note taker, uh, who we sometimes re refer to here as the bookman, uh, to uh, conduct uh, those, uh, that investigation. And then when you go through the crime scene the first time, it doesn't hurt to go through it a second time and perhaps switch jobs. So have a fresh set of eyes to look at the at the crime scene from another uh, perspective. Uh, it's, it's essential to avoid what I call tunnel vision, which means you, you latch on to a particular idea of what happened at the crime scene, and you just can't let it go and consider other possibilities. We had uh, of course, Los Angeles has uh, uh, a very big uh, uh, movie star community. You know, you have Bollywood, we have Hollywood. And one of the uh, famous up and coming stars uh, quite a number of years ago um, was, was murdered. He was uh, coming home and a couple of uh, guys came up to him and demanded money and he put up a, a a struggle and he was killed. Uh, it turned out that this particular individual uh, was known to be uh, gay. He was homosexual. And the detectives who were working the case immediately decided and assumed incorrectly that it had something to do with his chosen lifestyle, that uh, that was the reason for the killing. And they followed that trail doggedly for years. And as it turned out, it never went anywhere. Finally, uh, another person who had really nothing to do with the initial murder um, spoke to the prosecuting attorney and uh, 
said, well, if you are willing to give me a break in the sentencing for uh, the charges that I'm being tried for, I can give you information about who murdered this fellow. His name was Sal Minio. Um, and uh, so they checked out the story, and lo and behold, it turned out to be uh, this individual, this group of individuals. And uh, of course, um, they, they, the cops spent uh, two or three years just uh, chasing this fantasy because they had permitted themselves to believe that uh, something was so when it really wasn't. So the, the answer for any of us who are out of, uh, doing crime scene investigation is don't allow yourself to fall into this tunnel vision trap and be willing to accept other alternative theories about what might have happened and caused a particular crime to occur. Uh, as far as the order of collecting uh, evidence, uh, my recommendation is always to try to collect the most fragile evidence first. So by this, I mean uh, photographing the, the crime scene before moving anything, uh, testing for uh, collecting latent prints, fiber evidence, impression evidence, traces, and other small, minute types of evidence that could be uh, lost if they're not carefully collected initially. If you go in and start to uh, go through uh, the crime scene like a the per proverbial bull in a china shop, it's uh, likely you may lose some of these important uh, microscopic uh, pieces of evidence that may help at the end solve a crime. Nighttime crime scenes are uh, particularly problematic and uh, there it's tough to uh, conduct a proper crime scene investigation in the dark even if you are able to bring in uh, decent lighting through uh, use of generators uh, in in our uh, situation we would bring out the the fire department or fire brigade you may call it uh, who has a lot of these uh, high intensity lights to uh, check out a crime scene, but uh, it's still very difficult to uh, look and, and, and collect all the stuff with, uh, at night, and if you can, go for uh, daylight. Uh, you also need to consider external factors in terms of budgeting your time. How much time can you spend on a crime. If, if you're in the middle of a busy intersection, a busy street, this is a crime scene in New York City, uh, you can't very well shut down that uh, street for hours at a time. You have to get in, get the evidence as best you can, and get out and open things up again. Of course, there are going to be uh, situations where this is certainly not possible. I, I'm thinking of major terrorist, terrorist incidents. Uh, like our infamous 9-11 uh, case. I'm sure the, the bombing of that uh, hotel in Mumbai was a huge investigation that uh, you couldn't just uh, uh, wrap up in a, in a couple hours worth of effort. But uh, this is something that you need to keep in mind in conducting your crime scene. Um, who gets into the crime scene? Who gets to see what's going on? Um, you have a whole host of uh, people that have uh, more or less legitimate reasons to be at the crime scene. You have the crime scene investigators, the uniformed police, the detectives, the emergency medical team, the medical examiner, coroner, family members perhaps. And then of course you also have the press and the list goes on and on. So. Who's in charge of all this? Uh, typically, it's going to be the senior police officer who's in charge of the crime scene, and he has to make sure to try to have some control over the comings and goings of a crime scene. And it's not unusual for um, high-ranking police who are curious and want to come out to and see a crime scene to 
want to go in there and step over everything. And it's a real challenge to try to con contain that situation. Uh, one thing that we've done over the years is to uh, keep a log of everybody who walked in and walked out of the scene and, uh, you know, make sure you get their uh, name, their contact information, their badge number, and explain to them that uh, they may be called to court to testify. Uh, that may be enough to uh, keep some people out of uh, the scene. So th this is uh, this is again the the issue that I'm talking about in this in this particular uh, crime uh, slide to uh, try to manage the crime scene and figure out who needs to be in there and who ought not to be in there. And the same is true with who is the spokesperson for the scene for the crime. Um, it's not terribly unusual to get a whole bunch of uh, news people there and um, uh, who is the appropriate person to speak to that uh, the press uh, many uh, police agencies at least in the state states have PIOs public information officers these are uh, police that regularly deal with the uh, press they know them uh, they also are familiar with uh, how to conduct a crime scene investigation and what they can and can't be doing. You, you, collecting physical evidence, of course, is one of the uh, most important things that uh, we do at a crime scene investigation. And it's important to keep on, in mind that uh, there are both legal as well as scientific issues uh, at play. You, you certainly want to collect uh, evidence in a way that makes it useful uh, once the material comes into the laboratory to uh, be tested. You want to have adequate samples. You want to have reference samples. You don't want to contaminate uh, evidence with uh, background material. But you also have to keep in mind that there are also many legal issues that have to be uh, of your concern. Uh, was a, uh, a warrant needed? Did the, uh, did the courts have to get involved or the prosecutors have to get involved in allowing for certain evidence to be uh, collected? Uh, sometimes uh, this, is, uh, this is not... Uh, well done. I Early on in my career, when I didn't know any better, I was uh, called out to a murder investigation and uh, a car was involved and it was impounded at a police station and the detectives who were running the uh, uh, investigation had uh, submitted a request for a search warrant and it was a warm day and they were waiting and waiting, waiting, and they finally said, to heck with it, uh, the warrant will come here eventually and we'll just uh, write down the time when it comes rather than when we actually pop the, the uh, uh, trunk and um, um, that's not the way to do these things. You can get into a serious amount of trouble. Um, you need to uh, be certain to keep good contemporaneous notes as you're conducting the crime scene. Uh, it's practically an essential element of uh, conducting a, a good crime scene. Uh, it's impossible to remember everything that you've done uh, without noting it, putting the times down, um, and other information about the nature of the evidence where it was located with some measurements and such. And it's also important in maintaining a chain of custody of the evidence uh, uh, to have a decent set of notes. Um, you want to document the crime scene uh, as well, besides notes by photography, sketches, and in some cases, even video. 
Uh, we have an old adage that one picture is worth a thousand words, and it's generally better to take more photos than less, particularly now that they're all digital and you're not spending a lot of money on, on film. Um, sketches are also very helpful because they give a somewhat different perspective to the crime scene that uh, then just photos are able uh, to do. Uh, then some uh, agencies uh, here in the U.S. go even further than that, and they use video cameras to document the crime scene uh, that way. But if you're going to be using uh, video and even audio uh, to collect information, you have to make sure that you don't have any embarrassing background uh, comments that people at the crime scene are making because that is going to get into the record and could prove to be embarrassing at a later time. You, you want to be sure to look for things that uh, seem to be out of the ordinary. Um, you know, with the light switches on or off, uh, where uh, was food prepared? Was it still warm or was it cold? Uh, was there mail that was the recent mail or this was old mail? Um, just anything that just does not seem uh, to be right uh, uh, with you and uh, pay close attention to that kind of information. It may later prove to be uh, very important uh, for you in your crime scene investigation work. Uh, crime scenes are three-dimensional, so you want to make sure to look up. If you're outdoors, you know, take a, a look up in, in trees. Who knows what may have wound up there? Or in indoors, you may see blood spatter on the ceiling or on the, uh, on the walls. So just don't look at eye level or down. Uh, there may very well be uh, a lot of good information. I, one of my very first crime scenes that I was out on was uh, this woman was mur murdered by an axe in her home. And there were bits of brain and blood up the side of the wall and even up uh, onto the ceiling. And it, it was surprising to me how this stuff this evidence just got all over the place. I, it never occurred to me. And uh, it was a valuable lesson because uh, uh, I started to look at that. I, I was at a conference and I heard one interesting case. There was a lot of what seemed to be blood spatter on the ceiling. And it turned out that uh, there were a lot of flies in the room and the flies got uh, blood on their little feet and they flew up uh, on the ceiling and walked around and left uh, traces of blood out there. And the, the examiner's first uh, impression was that this was all blood spatter, but it was really caused by uh, insects. So there you go. It's uh, important uh, once you complete the survey of the crime scene to survey to canvas the canvas the neighborhood. It's not unusual for um, suspects to throw weapons away or items of clothing in, in the trash or in somebody's backyard. Uh, uh, some of the neighbors may have heard something that can give some additional information about uh, the uh, the scene of the crime. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's worthwhile uh, for you to uh, do. Now, before you leave the crime scene, it's also uh, useful to go through it a second time, uh, probably the third time now, because you should have done it twice, just to be sure before you leave that you've covered all the bases, that you've looked for uh, everything, uh, you've satisfied yourself that you've uh, uh, seen uh, what it is that needed to be uh, collected. You, you've documented everything and you don't have to embarrass yourself by later on realizing that you uh, forgot to uh, examine something that you may have missed. 
And finally, um, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't tell you to use common sense. Um, I, I know when I was first learning about conducting crime scene investigations, the people that were training me gave me a long list of do's and don'ts that uh, I had to um, follow. And um, I took these things as being uh, the absolute truth that I had to follow in all um, instances. Well, it turns out that there are going to be uh, situations where you have to um, find workarounds, way, ways to deal with uh, things. And that's why I say common sense. So uh, one thing I was trained early on was never, ever use plastic bags to package bloody clothes because if you seal them up, the bloody garments are going to putrefy and decompose, decompose any of the uh, blood uh, proteins and DNA and whatnot that uh, you might find useful. However, if you're just moments away from your forensic laboratory and you have a whole bunch of uh, wet garments, bedding, clothing and whatnot, there's no problem to put it into a large plastic garbage bag to bring it to the laboratory. You just don't want to keep it in that bag for uh, days at a time. And uh, that's a, certainly a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And that's what I mean by exercising some uh, level of common sense. So I want to uh, thank you uh, very much for your kind uh, offer and attention uh, to uh, have me speak with you today and lead off your conference, which I'm hopeful will be uh, most successful. I'm going to stop screen sharing now, and if we have time, we can uh, do some Q&A. So back to the chair.